Nigeria's federal government is considering acquiring 4.4 billion US dollars in new loans as national debt reaches 101 trillion naira. I am Bola Oba. This is Plus Politics. government to secure four billion dollars new loans as burden its as loan burden its 101 trillion naira. In the past year the federal government has obtained loans totaling 4.95 billion dollars from the World Bank resulting in a total public debt of 101 trillion naira. This has raised concerns about the rising expenses associated with servicing external debt. According to data from the Debt Management Office, the nation's, the nation's public debt stood at approximately 97 trillion naira in December 2023. Furthermore, the government anticipates securing additional loan approval amounting to 4.4 billion US dollars from both the international lender and the Africa Development Bank within the next 12 months. These rising expenses associated with servicing foreign debt pose a serious threat to Nigeria's economy, potentially leading to a diversion of resources from essential areas like healthcare, education, and infrastructure, thereby worsening socioeconomic issues. Nevertheless, a significant number of Nigerians have developed a growing sense of resentment whenever they learn about the government's plans to borrow, considering the prolonged deterioration of infrastructure and rising unemployment rates. They find it difficult to justify the need. They find it difficult to justify the need for additional borrowing when past borrowings have not been adequately accounted for. Joining us to look at this is a research analyst at Lagos Business School, Edidiong Ekoto. Also joining us is a development economist, public policy analyst, and chairman of board, Amaka Chikwe Uba Foundation, Akuf. Professor Chikwe Uba, business development specialist, Business Development Specialist, Believe We Boy. Gentlemen, welcome to Plus Politics. Fantastic. Just, uh, how would you want to start? What's your take of this uh, news about a new, a new loan that the federal government intends to, to take? Are you starting with me? Yes, please. Okay, um, well, first of all, I, I want to stop you right there. You know, when you say that Nigeria's loan will climb to about 101 trillion naira, that's not correct. Nigeria's loan will climb as high as 111 trillion naira by the time you include all the, the you know, loans. The federal government has taken a lot of loans this year, mind you. Um, this year alone, the federal government has taken, has issued about five trillion naira in treasury bills alone. They've issued uh, FGN bonds. They've even taken a loan about two point two billion dollars from the um, African Development Bank already. So Nigeria's loan, when you factor in all, if, as a matter of fact, by the first quarter of twenty twenty four. The federal government has up to 10 loans to the tune of 7 trillion naira, Bola. 7 trillion naira in the first quarter of 2024 alone. When you look at you know, the, um, the treasury bills and the bonds and you know, uh, you know, all the debt in instruments that they issued early this year. And mind you, the budget deficit this year is supposed to be 9 trillion naira. And now we're hearing they're talking about a supplementary budget. So 
uh, you asked me how do I feel about Nigeria going for another loan? Let's you know get you know our facts right to begin with. Nigeria's loan will climb as high as 111 trillion naira, if not more, by the time we factor in um, these uh, loans that they're about to take. Classical, classical economists will tell you that there is nothing wrong about uh, about that in loans. Uh, what's important is what the loan is used used for. And an average government official wanting to justify the loan will tell you that they want to put it to infrastructure development, they want to put it on human capital development uh, projects. I'm sitting here now, I'm thinking what specifically nurtures or what specifically um, powers your reservation about Nigeria getting this loan, this particular one. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with taking loan, uh, of course, as an economist would say. Um, but the issue with Nigeria has always been the way that these loans have been deployed. I mean, whenever the federal government goes to take loan, it's always a deja vu for any Nigerian. Even the average Nigerian that has followed, you know, our you know political and economic terrain, it's always a deja vu. They have gone again. They want to improve each Nigerians again. So I think for us, it's been the sheer lack of accountability. And I want to give you an example. Out of um, the $4.4 billion uh, that they want to take within the next um, 12 months, they've talked about spending some on renewable energy. They've talked about spending some on power projects. They've talked about spending it on women empowerment. They've talked about spending it on girl child education. They've talked about using it, you know, to to shore up their economic reforms, but it's always a lack of accountability. And quote me today, Bola, a year from now, two years from now, let us get together again and ask how was the money deployed. It's always down. To the lack how would you of feel? How would you feel if I want to play the devil's advocate and I'm saying, okay, maybe you're getting too cynical. Uh, if I want to say, come to think of it, in this age of ESG, uh, you know, the direction to go will be what they have stated they want to use the loan for, to build or to to increase the volume of alternative energy uh, that, the, that the Nigerian economy needs. So would you, by chance, uh, want to believe that you may be sounding too cynical you just, I just have to have that. Well, well, we can throw the part of cynicism and we can also throw the part of realism, which is let us look at the antecedents and what are the antecedents for Nigeria as far as taking loans is concerned. And we haven't really seen, but we've seen, so we've seen it with the rail project. I don't want to call it a failed project, but we've seen the state of Nigeria's railway after taking so much in loans from China. So I, I would probably, you know, stack my faith with facts, with the antecedents and what we've seen. And the government really is a continuum. I'm not really looking at the government as a continuum. It's an APC government. Transition into another APC government. So as a Nigerian, really, um, Bola, I hope for the best. But optimism has to be backed with some degree of fact. It has to be backed with some degree of reality. And with regard to this APC government, I'm afraid we really haven't seen any level, any measure, any modicum of accountability as far as the loans they've taken and so far are concerned. Some classical uh, economists may also want to uh, say, you know what, relative to uh, GDP, that our debt profile is still manageable. After all, you have countries like uh, Italy, you have countries like even the United States of America, you have countries even in the third world, you know, third world uh, class, whose debt to GDP is sometimes as much as 100%. That they tell you Nigeria's debt to GDP is just about 
it's less than 50 percent and uh, then what's the worry why uh, some of you um some of you public analysts and uh, economic commentators is pessimistic about nigeria getting loans to galvanize economic development how would you respond to that uh, again bola I, I wouldn't call it pessimism and i want to say that the argument of debt to gdp uh, ratio is one of the what the most warped arguments you know that are ever had and i would say to the economists that gdp does not pay back loans what actually pays back loans is revenue <laughs> and when you look at the debt to revenue ratio it's not so good for nigeria so uh, i would encourage us to to refrain from always going to because that's always the argument most of the time the government will say our credit ratings you know internationally are still good they, they're going to say um our debt to gdp is still good but gdp does not pay back uh, uh debt what pays back debt is uh, revenue and I, I had an interesting chat with the director general of the budget office some time ago a few months ago and I asked him the question why are we always operating this deficit budget uh, that budget that we always have to you know go a to to fill this shortfall and he said that the key for us is to generate revenue and we are not currently there his exact words and you know listening to you i cannot but uh, remember that dictum that he who goes uh, borrowing goes uh, sorrowing but we are talking about a national economic development now and i, I must uh, like i said earlier on sorry if i'm sounding a bit uh, i must play the devil's advocate i must test the integrity of uh, your submissions and your reasonings uh, and another direction i want to take it to would be okay what is peculiar what is peculiarly bad about the nigerian revenue profile that is uh that is making somebody like you to sound like an alarmist uh, just asking not that i want to be rude to my my revered guest i just have to ask you what is peculiarly bad about a revenue profile that is making that is perturbing enough to you to be sounding this clarion call to to realism okay i, I want to start there by looking at the medium to short term um, debt management strategy of the debt management office if you look at that document it says that Nigeria is trying to scale back. I mean, sometime um, during the COVID-19, we saw how Nigeria uh, couldn't really play in the international capital market. And that was the reason why we couldn't really issue euro bonds, which we are going to do sometime later this year. So the debt uh, management office said, okay, we're going to scale back on um, foreign loans. And we want a 75 to 25% uh, uh, ratio between um, local debt and foreign debt. My calculation as of um, sometime April this year, we were doing between um, 55 to 45, which is way beyond the, the, the target that the federal government has set for itself. And now they want to take um, um, 4.4 billion, further taking up the foreign debt profile. So the way we are going, Probably maybe by the end of the year we'll be looking at 50-50, which I'm not the one who set this, you know, strategy, this um, medium to short-term um, debt management strategy. They are the experts, the debt management office, and they are said, listen, foreign debts are hurting us, and we've seen it. With Nigeria is not a country that earns so much um, 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 foreign currency, so it's not even wise for Nigeria to always look to borrow from foreign sources and here we go again so the, the, the second point I, again that i want to make is the fact that when you look at the debt servicing relative to the revenue nigeria is making i mean again i don't want to sound like an alarmist but within the next before 
um, President Tinubu's tenure is over, Nigeria will be looking at probably towards 200 trillion naira in debt. And when you look at our debt profile just maybe eight, ten years ago, uh, you wonder really, how did we get here? Uh, we got we got here because uh, we went to borrowing. <laughs> That's the reality. If we didn't borrow and if we have not incurred the debts, uh, the figures will not pile up as much as they are. We are where we are now. Uh, you see, we can we can sit here and be speaking to all the pessimist, pessimistic indications or indicators for as long as uh, possible. But talking to somebody who uh, who should be in the know, what would be some ideas that you want to put on the table for redirection, you know, a positive redirection of uh, how the economy is being managed? Especially, well, especially as it pertains to our debt management and getting ourselves out of this seeming uh, financial cool de sac. Well, the simple truth is, Bola. So, a uh, friend of mine once said, "This feels cool, Marcus." <laughs> yeah, the, the simple truth is that our economic managers—they know the truth. They know the answers during the the campaigns. They tell us all the right things, and you know that gives you a sense that they know what needs to be done. It's quite unfortunate that when they get into power, they do the, the exact opposite. And during campaign, we heard this government say we are going to scale back on borrowing. We're going to scale back on borrowing. And now, just in its first year, they are already on the way to exceeding the budget deficit of nine trillion. Now, Nigeria is definitely going to borrow more than nine trillion this year. As a matter of fact, they have already borrowed up to nine trillion. If you look at you know all of the debt instruments. You know that they have issued from the bonds to treasury bills and you know the loans from these multilateral agencies. So the, the, it doesn't really help when you say I'm going to do this and you get in and you, you do quite the opposite. Nigeria has a lot of potential with regard to um, revenue generation that we are not tapping into. Nigeria has potential in the uh, area of tourism. Uh, 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 solid minerals. Uh, the, the list is endless, really, Bola, with regards to to the, the sources that Nigeria can tap. Nigeria as a country used to be the top uh, producer of palm oil in the world, just less than you know half a century ago. And today, Nigeria is importing oil, uh, palm oil from Malaysia, from different parts of Asia. That is that is um, that is alarming, really. An average, and, an average. And, and, and I, and I, I, I want to say this: the key for Nigeria to to bolster our economy, to to get to a level where we borrow less, is really the manufacturing sector. You look at the potential that Nigeria's manufacturing sector has, and you wonder why it has been in a perpetual state of neglect. A Nigerian, Kalu Idika, was part of the team that handed Korea their roadmap to the success that they enjoy today. Korea was not always, you know, uh, um, known for its manufacturing forward. You mean, you mean uh, uh, Honorable Kalu Idika, Kalu, former uh, exactly. of finance under Babangida, and exactly. the former World Bank, World Bank expert? Oh, okay, I, I, I'm. I um, just have to ask you this. A fanatical supporter of the president may tell you, okay, what else would you want him to do? He came into power, he, you know, the sheer mark of much courage, he removed the subsidy. And, you know, apart from removing subsidy, he's been trying to do all he knows best to do with his economic team to to revitalize the economy. But in the interim, uh, there are some imperatives that any reasonable government must, uh, must do. Imperatives such as uh, funding the budget, imperatives such as uh, 
you know, welfare in a very poverty reduced economy like ours, and where uh, far above sixty percent of the population uh, lives in utter indigence. You know, a welfare services and, and all the nuts. So why are some of you people critical? These are just seemingly inevitable. And he has to, you know, they, they have to take the loan to, to keep the machinery of state and the economy running. How would you respond to that? Well, um, Bola, I, I want to say that if there's one thing I'm convinced of is that governments, you know, um, the, the, the first thing any government should um, uh, be able to do is take responsibility. And, and it, we, we always say the buck stops with the president, really. And the buck has to stop with the president. This government was, was not unaware of the economic situation that it was going to come to inherit when it made all the promises that it made to Nigerians. So and it didn't also help it, 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 it all boils down to, to decision making, really, Bola. It didn't also help for the president to stand on his inauguration ground and say, subsidy is gone. The president couldn't have known what was happening in Nigeria's downstream sector on his inauguration ground for him to stand up and say, subsidy is gone. So the wise thing, course of action, would have been to, okay, let's see. Let's go back and strategize. What do we do? What kind of buffers? So much of what we're seeing today really are, um, you know, just products of decision making. What okay, so it's not, it's not about what did we come to inherit. It's, it's about how did we manage it. Look at the governor of Abia State, for instance. I'm not the one saying it. If you look at the reviews, I'm sure you know the neutrals would say it's not doing a bad job. He equally inherited a very difficult situation when he came in. But at least anybody who has observed the Abia State impartially would say, okay, uh, there's, there's room to be optimistic about what this guy is doing here. You see, uh, going back to the average fanatical supporter of the, of the president again, some may tell you, ah, but any reasonable or any avid follower of uh, political of the political economic situation of Nigeria would have known that uh, at the point where he was uh, reading his inauguration speech, it was indeed a fact, a fact in law that uh, the preceding administration had enacted a law for the uh, total escapation of, uh, of subsidy, that whether he mentioned it or he did not mention it, it was inevitably less than one calendar month from the time he, he was doing the speech, it was inevitably going to be faced anyway. So why are you people clubbing in, you know, just mouthing what an average fanatical supporter of the president may want to say? How would you respond to that? Well, I would say to the average fanatical uh, um, supporter of this administration that uh, you can't have it both ways, really. This administration, the APC government in general, we've seen how um, adept they've been with regard to flouting. This is the first government we see. They flout all of us. They treat basically the constitution like a list of suggestions. So you cannot just come and say, okay, I I'm not sure if there was any law, really. But even if there was, we've seen time and time again the APC government treating the constitution like it's a list of suggestions. So I'm very sure that uh, um, if they wanted to uh, um, critically evaluate what was happening, to say, okay, before we stand at our camp uh, inauguration ground and say subsidy is done, let us go back, strategize. What kind of buffers do we offer to Nigerians? What kind of safeguards? What fail safe plans do we have in place before we see lift up our hands and see subsidy is gone? Much of the suffering Nigerians are going through today just boils down to the removal of subsidy and the unification of, uh, of the uh, exchange rate. And this 
um, to uh, policy reforms, as much as we know in the long run what's supposed to you know, benefit the Nigerian economy, they were not well thought out, and the extenuating circumstances were not put in place, unfortunately. So, uh, if uh, can I insinuate that you are one who believes that uh, the government is a bit, or uh, this administration is not quite, uh, don't quite think through things well enough before, you know, policies well enough before they are enunciated, and you are sounding as though. Uh, you don't see the economic managers uh, turning this ship around from its course of uh, from its course to negativity. Uh, if I if I understood you well, um, I'm afraid so. I would have to say so. And you just hear me out so that I can at least give you the reasoning behind my uh, submission. Well, I, I've, I've always been wary of a governance system that is based on a reward system, okay? Because this person worked during election. Let us give him this position. Because this person did this during election. It, 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 it doesn't have to boil down to that. We saw just a few weeks after the ministers were inaugurated, a minister was uh, uh, um, a uh, uh, book for you know financial malfeasance. And when I asked the question, how did this person image the minister? Most of what I heard from the great band anyway was how this person worked during an election. And when you see most of those people who surround the president, uh, we know he has been in governance for like forever. So we know his friends, we know his cronies. And I, for one, am very skeptical of when a governance system becomes like a reward system. Uh, I am very, you know, skeptical about such a government uh, really working in the interest of the people, no matter what anybody says. But you see, it's almost inevitable in a liberal democracy where you you get to become the head on to because some people have made sacrifices for you. They're taking the bullets for you. They and you would in the you know in the peculiar situation that we find ourselves, uh, because we are replicating the American presidential system of government, and at some point uh, the incumbent would also want to seek re-election, and uh, those who have worked for him in the past to make to make him get to where he is, he knows he'll still be needing them. What do you do? In such an environment, it's not peculiar to Nigeria. Look at all the liberal democracies in the world. I mean, yeah. back in the ground, and electioneering campaigns are going on. And you know, the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party that's been historically the party of you know a party that's been taken serious when it comes to governance, is in the very is in a is in a mess as it is because. The electorate just believe that they seem to have squandered it. They, they can't be taken serious anymore. So what's peculiar about our client? What's peculiar about the Nigerian policy? Okay, but I'm going to cite two examples right now. And I'll leave you to, you know, chew on that. The first one is that a former governor of Ekiti State came out on national television, or whatever it was, but it was all over the, the internet, to say that when the former president decided to take out subsidy, we knew it was going to be beneficial to Nigerians, but we protested against it. Why? <laughs> because it's just politics. So this government has already told you, listen, we don't care about Nigerians. <laughs> we care about our interests. I'm not, it's not me that said it. I'm not the one who said it. He said it. That's I, what I, I just also told you, I just also told you that that is a peculiar phenomenon in any... No, it isn't. I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid not. It isn't. And I want to cite another example. You talked about, um, you know, other parts of the world. 
let's look at you know some of the developed uh, countries in the world. Have you ever seen a situation whereby a minister has been booked for financial malfeasance? And oh, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll just be notified. No, no, bro. no, bro. I'll come back to you. I've just been intimate. I've just been intimated that uh, we have Professor Chiwoku Uba uh, uh, on there on, online with us. Uh, Prof, how are you? I'm good. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Prof. Uh, your your prologue to the news making the waves that uh, this administration is seeking another 4.4 billion US dollars low cumulatively from two organizations uh, one African uh, entity and uh, the World Bank your take sir well um I've been uh really averse to taking loan for consumption as it were even though when we normally go for these loans the the reason has always the question has always been that it's for capital uh, expenditures but over time the trend has shown when you look at the the budget analysis of financial statements and analysis you discover that over 60 percent of the loan we've taken in the last eight years you know, we are used for recurrent expenditure. And that is as a result of the our uh, uh, budget credibility issues, uh, where we we'll make over estimation of, uh, of forecast of revenue vis-a-vis -vis expenditure. So for me, whereas at a stance today that is inevitable for the government at all levels, both at the national level and at the subnational level to take loans, I'm worried that the loans are, are largely deployed to funding recurrent expenditure. I think that's where I have my own issue. And if you check the debt service rates over the last two years or three years, we have used over 80% of our revenue to service debt, not just to repay debt, but to pay interest on, 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 on debt that we have accumulated. And what it means, given the level of revenue we are getting so far, unfortunately, we've not seen the uh, first quarter budget performance report for 2024 for federal government to, to know what actually we've uh, received in terms of revenue to know how much we are repaying and all that. Uh, on that basis, I'm very, very wary, afraid that taking more loans will cause us more problems. But if we have been very, very disciplined in the deployment of loans we've collected in the past, you know, funding productive capital projects, mark my words, productive capital projects, uh, I wouldn't have any issues. But uh, the trend has shown that uh, the loans we've taken so far, most of them we are deployed for recurrent, and for even the ones that we are used for, capital projects. There were more of projects that were more politically inclined than economic oriented, as it were. Uh, but it's inevitable as it stands now. So what, what we should be asking the federal government to do is to pr provide clear information on what these debts or new debts that is being accrued uh, will be used for. And is it, it depends on now, it now behaves on the citizens also to follow these funds to ensuring that they were used for the purposes for which they were being uh, accumulated. Uh, uh, Prof, before I you now ask you questions on some of the things I gleaned from your, from your uh, uh, introductory remark, uh, can you briefly, in no more than 30 seconds, give us an understanding of your foundation, what exactly the foundation is uh, is uh, focused on? Just, I, I read it late before I came on here. I didn't quite have the opportunity of doing good enough research. I, I like to ask people around uh, things that I know they are passionate about. Sorry okay. About I, I, no, no problem. Actually, the Foundation is focused more on health. It's health related because it was a foundation established 
uh, following the death of my wife from asthma crisis. So he oh, looks so, at health, so he looks at health financing uh, for those with respiratory conditions. Incidentally, it has three centers: Center for Asthma, Allergy, and Respiratory Conditions. It has Center for Politics and Governance. It has Center for Development. So it looks at key issues with respect to policies and governance. It looks at key issues with respect to development, governance in totality, but more importantly, focusing on health. Uh, sorry about that, Prof. Uh, may I so rest in, in perfect peace? Uh, I, you know, I just wanted to, I, I really sympathize with you, but I, I pray, you. you know, that uh, a legacy will be further enriched with this uh, society impacting project that you've, uh, you've started, Donabia. Uh, but we also have another guest online. Uh, how would you want to? How would you want to start your opening opening salvo? Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to say that uh, I don't think any one of us here is against borrowing. I think what we are all against is the fact that the federal government have not demonstrated capacity to manage borrowed funds. I think that is what everybody is just saying from Prof and from uh, Rooney. So that, that's what we are all saying. Successive governments have not demonstrated capacity, have not shown competency, have not shown uh, truth in management of borrowed funds. Just like what Prof has said, all the funds that they've borrowed over the years have been used to save the current fund, record expenditure. And then the other ones that are used for in code capital projects are politically motivated. They are neither completed, they are neither here or there. We can look the case, the case of um, the uh, Air Nigeria, the F, the F fleet one, how billions of naira was used to paint a plane. No, I think that all things they're borrowing money for. So anyone who is passionate about Nigeria will kick against borrowing. Not because borrowing is bad in this sense, but because the people who are borrowing this money, who are using this money, are not managing them appropriately. I think that here's the bottom line. Okay, you, 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 you're talking about the rail line to Maradi in the jail. You're talking about a government that came into power and that has denunciated uh the policy of doing a road from Lagos to Calabar for some, especially those who would uh who would ultimately benefit from projects like this will tell you how political they may be, but they are gonna be positively impactful that the multiply effect. You can imagine if you have a robust arterial road from Lagos going to Calabar the enormous amount of economic activities that will be galvanized on the coastline of Nigeria across about nine states of the Federation. And I'm, I'm listening to, to you, not you alone, even Prof and uh, my uh, other guest. I'm thinking, uh, are, you, are you as past not getting too cynical or oh, could it be the fault of the political class? Oh, you're making fun of me. May God forgive you. I'm doing the sign of the cross for you. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm also thinking, you know what? As somebody who has uh, been around, I, I, what would you have done if we were to swap places today with the president when you have this mediocrity? already entrenched in our senior civil service, when you don't have professionals who can hold their ground and tell the political class, because in most of the societies where we have seen successes, be it China on the extreme end of the pendulum, would you want to say autocracy, be it Singapore, if you want to say liberal democracy, be it even Rwanda, if you want to talk about, you know, level of, uh, you know, developmental strides, at least in the same geo geographical or geopolitical zone, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking all the societies that I've seen 
being positively transformed in the world, the, the machinations, the power driving these successes, the sustainability of these successes, are actually built on the competence of the civil service. What would be your response to that? Really, what uh, I wouldn't say it is absolutely built on the competences of the civil service. The, I would rather say that, uh, yes, it is, but the political will is stronger. It is the politicians that are in the key decisions. We well, have a permanent secretary, and those guys don't really have the capacity. Commissioners for these, ministers for that, these are the people who make those political decisions, these are the people who sign the checks. Not the permanent secretaries, not the level 12, level 15, level 16 civil servants. You understand? So the bottom line is that it is those in politics, those who hold political positions, elective positions, that make key decisions. And as long as these guys have not demonstrated competencies, we're going to keep having these challenges. So I think it's, it's we call it leadership, right? So we have over the years we have politicians who have not demonstrated leadership capacities in any way. And just like what the other uh, uh, analyst said, we now have politicians who are placed into positions based on reward systems. And that is a problem. Not because the person is competent, not because the person is an aristocrat, or not because they have one industrial experiences or whatever experience. Now you notice that the few positions that are appointed based on competencies, like uh, the guy in the, the, the digital economy right now, and those two guys that are in the digital economy space, and all that, you see that, the, the, the way they are pushing for development is not the same way those who came in there purely by political appointment based on reward system. You, you see the, 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 the gap. It's a huge gap. So if government really wants to do the right thing, the bottom line is they must be able to appoint people, whether from the civil service level or from the corporate uh, uh, level, they must get people who are ready to do the work. Okay. 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 You're doing an intellectual overkill of the point. You, you, know, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling you're giving me a roundhouse house intellectually, or now you, the pungency with which you're making the point and the examples you're using. Uh, nobody can fault your argument in the allusion you've made to uh, the minister of digital economy. Let me go to your colleague now. Uh, not prof, uh, your, my guest number one. Uh, okay, uh, you know, your colleague has knocked me back to you now that uh, maybe is the lack of seriousness of the political class and the overemphasis in rewarding uh, partisans like them at the expense of professionalism and, uh, and expertise. Uh, that seems to be pushing us further down uh, this uh, this ladder. Um, what do you have to, to say to that? Although it goes in the direction of what you had earlier expressed as, as a point before. Yeah, um, well, I think my colleague here has already uh, made a very fine point to that end. Um, political appointment that we have seen uh, I think that for me was uh, the, 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 the worrying sign, the number one worrying sign. And I was going to make the point earlier that we have a guy who is in charge of the ministry and there's a huge corruption scandal. And we didn't really have so much in terms of the investigation. And the same person is the president of the Senate today. But we have not had the last of the corruption scandal at the NDDC. So, it, uh, what are actions inspire hope? It's not what you see, no matter what you see. It doesn't really inspire hope with, you know, among the people compared to what you do. And when you do things like this, the situation whereby, you know, someone is in the you know, spotlight for, you know, political corruption, and the next moment is getting a promotion, uh, it's, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> Uh, that's why you know I sound so pessimistic. Okay, uh, okay. we have we have a couple of minutes, uh, and uh, it, it is my tradition to not let my my viewers, uh, you know, 
not leave them in hopelessness or in utter pessimism. I, I, I know the reason we have called upon the three of you uh, is because we know you have something upstairs. What are the ideas that we, we people like you would want to put on the table even if they don't eat those advice, at least some people will remember that oh, you somebody said it the other day or somebody put it on the table. Let's go in the direction of uh, preferring solutions or preferring uh, disaster rescue ideas. I'll start with you. Okay, yeah, I think that um, first of all, this government needs to cut down on its pushback. Uh, being a government that has faced so much criticism, of course, apparently, given the current economic hardship, the government has spent much of its time, you know, doing pushbacks and anything else. Uh, of course, there's no magic wand that is going to get us out of the woods. So what I would like to see, you know, from this government would be, um, you know, um, a targeted uh, um, effort towards solving one particular problem. You know, I have a very strong relationship with Nigeria's manufacturing sector, and I've always said, if Nigeria can solve the issue of manufacturing, if a manufacturer cannot buy diesel at a thousand naira, he cannot spend how much he is spending to manufacture a Nigeria. Maybe this textile, for instance, the Nigerian textile is always going to be more expensive. We are never going to be able to be competitive. And I've always said that the one problem, you see, uh, the power is up, that the government can fix, and you will fix 40% of the problem in this economy is power. So I would like to see, just forget about trying to solve all the problems. Just focus your energy on one thing. Let's say we are going to solve the issue of power within the next. This, I mean, you can solve the issue of, um, let's say, multiple taxation. You probably would have solved the issue, uh, ten percent of the problem. You can solve the forex issue. Probably you solved twenty-five, thirty percent of the problem. The one issue that you can solve today in Nigeria's economy, and you would have solved forty percent of the problem we are having in the economy. In power. So I would like to see the government channel so much energy to see how they can but, develop. But, but one of the one of the reasons for which they say they want to take this 4.4 billion US dollars is to uh to incentivize people to take to alternative energy generation. Now I wouldn't know whether that you know, knocks any door. In your intellectual, in your intellectual household, I, I don't, you know. I, 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 it's, a good plan. Plan. It's, it's just about the honesty in the execution, but it's a good plan. You know, the, the loans they've outlined say they want to uh, uh, invest in the power sector. They want to invest in alternative energy. These are very lofty ideas. It's just about the execution, the honesty of it. Well, okay. Let me go to Prof now, Prof. We can't, uh, you know, if uh, if anybody uh, is watching us now, Prof, uh, and uh, they're listening to uh, people as gifted as you guys and, you know, intellectually rich as you guys, you must be able to deposit some ideas in their minds and heads that uh, we can get out of this. Prof, your suggestions, please, your ideas, please. Yeah, first, since we are discussing about debt management, the first thing I think we need to do is to uh, move towards using private equities, you know, move, move using public-private uh, partnership vehicles. Uh, yeah, business vehicles. Model. Yes, business model. So that reduces the pressure on the government to fund some of these projects. But the key issue is that this isn't a power up policies some assaults that we've experienced over the years needs to be addressed because that is a key disincentive to even those who may want to invest, you know, in that model. Secondly, as um, the last speaker spoke, we need to deal with the issue of electricity. But beyond making that real investment first, it's important that government has a quick win hanging fruits 
uh, subsidize energy for manufacturers. That needs to happen. And um, secondly, also, is to make sure that some of the goods that our government entities are using, say, for, for instance, the textile industries, we can have a policy that makes it mandatory for government to use uh, local test five schools in Nigeria use local test five. So you provide markets for the products immediately. That needs to happen. Secondly, also, third, also, I think, yes, floating of the currency would have been nice if we have a supply, if we have enough supply. But given that we don't have enough supply of forex now, I would recommend that we have a fixed exchange rate. We can say 1,000 or 1,000, but it doesn't really matter what the exchange rate is. But the most important is to have an exchange rate that investors can plan on. The likelihood of the exchange rate is not allowing investors to plan as it stands today. And that is also affecting the le level of investment that we are having in the country and productivity level. So that needs to happen as well as a quick way. And lastly, you know, when we argued earlier, we pushed everything to the politicians, but that is not the truth. The major key problem we're having is also the disconnection between public administration and governance. Uh, the permanent secretaries are the chief accounting officer of every MDA, of every ministry, not even the minister. No minister signs any check. So if the public servants or civil servants are well trained and capacitated as they should, they should be able to do things that will enable the, the, the rules of government to run as, 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 as it were. They know the rules. That is why when politicians try to push them by the back, when they want to share whatever thing they make, they will bring the rules and do what we call the banana peels that will bring the politician down. And if you look, look at it, most of the cor cor huge corruption cases that we are witnessing in these countries were perpetrated by the civil servants, directors of finance, accountant general, permanent secretaries, and all that. So it is the, is the, is the civil servants that, uh, that teach the politicians how to look at this. So there's a, a very big need to once again look at our public service or public administration to make sure they are strengthened to be able to do the work they have been assigned to do. That means Thank you, Thank you Prof. Thank you, Prof. Uh, you know, it's actually one of the one of the uh, points with which I asked one of your colleagues a uh, question earlier on. I, I'm one who still believes that the quality, the intellectual firepower within our public service is a bit leafy. I, 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 I may be wrong. I, and I've been to a number of countries across the world and I see that the public service, the quality of the people who run the public service naturally instruct the quality of development you see. But don't let me take it away from you. Yeah. You made it so pungently and so concisely, sir. Um, the man who took me to digital economy and knocked me out, uh, your, your uh, epilogue, please, uh, you know, your dinamo, how would you want to sign off? Okay, <clears throat> I want to say, um, in terms of solutions, I, I think uh, I want to buttress what the uh, prof has said the balance between the public servant and the politicians, which is, and that balance point is leadership. So, if, and I've been to see that a lot of agencies are coming up right now that are doing training and empowerment for those in public service and those in the, and, and the politicians, training them to understand leadership. And uh, leadership in this case boils down to empathy and then people-centered uh, laws. Because if you are a leader and you don't... Now, any leader in this time who is not feeling the pain of the Nigerian people is not worthy to be called a leader. You understand? So uh, that, that is my point. So we must come to see that there are people who are suffering in the country. Therefore, leaders must not take charge and take ownership of how do we prefer solutions to these people. So now, once you understand the concept of leadership, empathy, and people-centered decisions, now one very key thing that must be taken into urgent consideration is the government should stop pushing money and focus on capital development. Now, the, 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 the emphasis on money, 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 the rate at which people are hearing figures, $3 billion, $100 billion, $1 trillion, this, this money are too huge 
to be made sure that if they are just 5,000 or 50,000 or 100,000. So the emphasis should, should, should reduce from money pushing to capital development uh, projects, and that helps people to now focus on Thank you much. Thank you, gentlemen. You have, you have actually enriched the program today. I've learned one or two things about, you know, very stimulating intellectual uh, session with you guys. We do appreciate you and the rest assured we'll be we'll be calling on you some some other time not to not too far away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. For those of us watching this we wrap it up for today. We want to say thank you for being part of the program. Um my name is still Bola Oba. Have a good evening.